All right, I am recording and I think this will work. So I just did a live stream uh, recording or uh, going over this track, but there were a bunch of technical difficulties at the beginning of that live stream, but not just uh, like 18 minutes in, I think is where it cleared up. So I'm doing this now. I think I've solved all the technical difficulties and we're going to go through the track. So um, this is not going to be like a nice edited video. Just, just as a warning, um, but I'm going to try to not waste too much of your time, but it's not going to be edited. So um, I guess we can just start with where the track started. So this was in a live stream earlier um, where I recorded this stuff up here. Oh, nope. oh holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our day. And you can see how it's like kind of edited, like it's got these little gaps and stuff and that's because I didn't record that to a click because I mean this is all the odd time stuff I'm just kind of improvising it and that just comes from doing a lot of odd time um, over a long period of time um, so I basically just kind of improvised sung the melody and clapped um, so that I get the idea of where the rhythm is what what divisions I'm using and then also where the melody fits within those divisions then um, after that was done I was able to make this custom click, which sounds like this. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night. And this I I did on a live stream. Um, it's not public, but it's unlisted. Um, maybe I'll, I'll link that live stream in the description of this video. Um, but now we have this. Oh, and that's kind of where I left it off on that first live stream where I was really like, okay, we need to start this probably. Um, and then I also made this placeholder melody. Oh yeah, I think we also did this on the live stream. Which is kind of annoying sounding, but it's definitely, you can definitely hear the melody. And I feel like this has rotated a little bit. Okay. Anyway, that looks good. But anyway, we have this. And this is basically our scaffolding. Uh, on which we can build the rest of the song. You don't hear any of this stuff in the final version, but um, it's there. So then the first part that actually is heard in the final product. The drums. Uh, the drums took a very long time to record. I was recording for a few hours for them. Um, and then these are actually in order of when I recorded them. So I recorded the drums first, and then the piano, and then the bass, and then the vocals, uh, and then choir vocals after that. Um, and oh, holy night! the vocals actually took the least amount of time, and the drums took the most amount of time to record. And it all actually is in order like this. So the, pianos, the piano took like a couple hours, drums took like three hours, piano took like two hours, bass took an hour and a half, and then vocals only took like 20 minutes actually, um, because by that time, I just had been in this arrangement so much and it's only a minute long so it's really not that much content it's just complicated content rhythmically uh, but I had gotten a feel for it and the main actu the main problem actually in the lyrics was uh, was the lyrics or in the singing was remembering the lyrics so then we uh, we end up with this product of course and uh, of course the the uh, video will be linked in the description if you for some reason haven't seen that or if you just want to go back to it again after after watching this um but you know we end up with this product oh, holy night. which is kind of fun so um i want to look at some really interesting stuff with the drums and mixing the drums i only have one microphone to record the drums with basically i do have a second microphone over here but uh, i only recorded the drums with one mic trying to record with this mic as well would be very impractical uh, for a number of reasons, but um, just this one mic, recording drums with one mic, not easy, um, and the mix is is never going to sound spectacular, um, especially with respect to like stereo separation. That's pretty difficult. Um, there are maybe ways you could do it, but we'll see. Um, <laughs> basically, there are four different tracks that I'm using for the drums, which is odd because there's only one mono track. So why am I using four? Well, there's an entrance track where the, the drums basically enter the mix. Um, but this one's not routed to the master. So you can see the routing down here. It's not routed to the master. Um, what it is routed to is a couple of other tracks. 
Oh, actually, the drum's out. Uh, I, either way would work here, actually. Okay, uh, that's weird. I mean, um, the drum's main could be routed to the 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 bass drum channel, or the drum's entrance could be routed to the bass drum channel. Either way would work. And actually, mm, well, I, I guess it would. The volume will be a little bit different if I if I change the routing, so I, I'll leave it as it is. But anyway, we have a place where the drums enter, and it goes off to the other channels. Uh, the, the really clever part was the snare fundamental, but to get there, we'll start with the, the bass drum. So with this bass drum channel, this is a channel that's not routed to the master, as you can see, uh, but it just isolates the really low frequencies. And what that means is that this channel will really only spike when the bass drum hits. So if I, if I go ahead and uh, solo this channel and play through it, you can see that it really only triggers when the kick drum happens. And that's exactly what we want because then we can use that to sidechain our bass, right? Uh, sidechaining the kick and the bass is really common, but you don't need all of the information in the kick drum signal to sidechain with the bass. You actually only really need that low frequency information because that's what you care about. And in fact, it may even be worth doing this when you have everything isolated. Um, in this case, I really have to do this because otherwise, the, you know, the, the, the hi-hat would be triggering the bass to go down as well, which doesn't make any sense. But um, this might be sensible to do even if you do have all the drums individually in their own separate channels because you really only care about those low frequencies conflicting. That's the point of sidechaining the kick and the bass is that the low frequencies conflict and they, they get muddy. And this might be worth doing even then. Like, who cares where the trans? Who cares what the transient is doing in the kick? You know what those high frequencies are doing. Who cares? That's not going to conflict with the bass. So, that's a thing. And then over here on the snare fundamental, we have this, which isolates the fundamental frequency of the snare drum, the like main tone that you get in the snare drum. And of course, that main tone goes down a little bit, but we got you know kind of the the main peak of it. So with this one. The kick drum is triggering it a little bit because the kick drum does trigger those frequencies, but the snare drum is the thing that will they'll make it hit the highest peaks. And what we can do with this is sidechain this using a peak controller in this case. Sidechain this to this. This right here is a high shelf. So this is a high shelf um, on the EQ, right, that is about, uh, what does it say there, 8434 hertz? Okay, so it's about 8.5 8 kilohertz, or not, <laughs> wait, yes, never mind, orders of magnitude, 8.5 kilohertz, that's where we are, 8500 hertz, um, and what this does is that it makes the snare louder relative to the high, or really it makes the hi-hats quieter relative to the snare drum. And basically the problem I had is without this on, basically what I was hearing is that the hi-hats were too loud. And the reason why this happens is, is more or less because in my drum setup that I have here, which I really like the sound of, but maybe not the balance of so much, especially when I'm just recording with a microphone, is that the hi-hat has a shirt in it, but it's like in the middle, right? Um, and so the stick is still hitting the metal of the cymbal directly, which means the peak volume for the hi-hat will be about the same as normal, even though the decay time will be a lot shorter. Whereas with the snare drum, there's actually a t-shirt on top of it, so when you hit it with the, with the stick, it's a lot quieter. So what that ends up doing is like making the snare a bit quieter relative to the hi-hat than I would like. Basically, the hi-hat is too loud. Like All the drums are kind of covered in, um, in fabrics here. Um, although the, I guess the kick drum isn't, but the kick drum has a pillow inside of it. And uh, the cymbals are not, right? The, the hi-hat has a shirt inside of it to make it have a shorter decay time, but the, the crash cymbal is just, just you know, normal. And then uh, the, the hi-hat still is getting hit directly. The metal is getting hit by the stick directly. And that just results in the hi-hat being a bit loud. So this was a kind of I think quite clever. I felt quite proud of myself, quite clever um, doing this. Uh, kind of a way of making um, the hi-hat quieter relative to the snare drum 
even though I don't have the hi-hat and the snare drum as separate things, um, because they at least occupy different parts of the frequency spectrum. If they occupy the same part of the frequency spectrum, or in other words, if I couldn't distinguish like between like times where the snare is going and the hi-hat isn't, or that kind of thing, then this would not really be possible. But fortunately, they do occupy different parts of the frequency spectrum, and so this is possible. <laughs> So you can see like when the kick drum goes, it kind of goes to about equal um, because the kick drum will trigger that that like uh, snare channel a little bit because some of the frequencies that come out of the kick drum line up. Uh, but when the snare goes, it like goes way up to here. So I, I think I moved the frequency a little bit there. Anyway, so it's not a huge difference and obviously the drums don't sound like spectacular and amazing. There's only so much you can do with one mic, but... That was kind of fun and interesting, perhaps. So that's the main deal with the drums. The piano was a MIDI piano this time. And that's different from normally uh, what I do, which is this. Uh, now I'm playing both. <laughs> Let me turn off my MIDI real quick. Or, sorry, this. So, so normally, let's see, are you hearing that? Yes, you are, except it's kind of quiet, isn't it? So normally, you'd probably hear this piano. And this is actually the piano that I heard while I was recording it. But what I did is I recorded with with um, the audio tracking this piano that's just the built-in, the main built-in piano of my keyboard. My Yamaha DGX620 keyboard, because some people were asking about what my keyboard is. I don't really recommend this keyboard. It's really old. Uh, there are better keyboards that you could get. This just happened to be what I got a few years ago. Um, well, actually, several years ago. I think I've had this keyboard for like six years now. Um, and even when I got it, it was an old keyboard. So I don't really recommend this keyboard, but people do ask what it is. It's the Yamaha DGX620. Uh, but there are better keyboards that you could get nowadays. Um... For the same price. I think it was like about $400. Um, although that included a stand as well. And a case. So, whatever. Um, but we got it on like Craigslist and stuff. Because I, I think it I think it came out in 2003. So, anyway. Um, but normally, you just get this piano sound, right? <laughs> Hopefully not that. Uh, but you didn't get that one here. You got this. Different piano sound, bit of reverb on that, hey. But um, this is a Yamaha C7 preset in Flex, which is a plugin from FL Studio. Um, Flex is kind of ironically named because it's not really that flexible. Like you can't really control that much um, detail in, in the patches, but um, you get some macros and it has some pretty nice sounding presets. And I like this Yamaha C7 one for rhythmic stuff like this. Um, I meant to play that on, on the on the on the C7. Here we go. Uh. Anyway, I really like it for that kind of rhythmic stuff. It's a pretty nice rhythmic sounding piano, but um, it's not useful for everything. It's not the best sounding piano ever, but it's pretty decent, and I thought it sounded pretty good. But the real reason why I went for that instead of my normal piano. Uh, was because my audio interface was not working properly, and uh, it, it is working properly now. I think I have figured out how to get it to work permanently, fingers crossed, um, but it's been sketchy, and uh, during the recording process, it was not working for me, and so uh, what I did is I I tracked this, this piano that's coming from my keyboard, tracked that live, um, so that's what I was hearing as I was recording it, but then I also was recording MIDI silently in FL Studio as I did that. So then we got the MIDI. Um, okay, that's the piano. Uh, the piano part was very difficult, and I should... Ooh, uh, yeah, that's right. So I'm going to hide my screen for a bit and grab the sheet music, <laughs> the chord sheet. So let me close that. Okay, so this is the chord sheet. This is the chord sheet. Uh, it's... 
kind of weird looking, I know. Uh, but this is the chord sheet that I used. Uh, if you just removed those chord symbols, then you would have exactly what I had on the music stand in the, the drum part. So if you look at the video um, in the you know lower left-hand corner with the drums, the thing on the music stand, that's this, but without the chord symbols. Um, and this is what I used, and this is what I was looking at um, in exactly the same kind of setup as I am right now. Um, except I had a camera over there and that was it. Um, or actually I had a camera more like over here. But anyway, um, I was just sitting here and I think I had my keyboard a little bit farther out. But basically, exactly like I'm sitting right now, just playing my keyboard, uh, looking at my <laughs> looking at my uh, computer screen. It's not my laptop screen anymore. Uh, it's so nice. It's not a laptop screen anymore. This is not my laptop. This is this is my PC and a dedicated monitor. It's so nice um, compared to the laptop. It is is very nice anyway um but this is what i looked at and it's kind of weird looking but basically um we have these like lines and each of them have a top and a bottom part the top parts are for the twos and the even divisions and the bottom parts you know the twos and the fours so you see lots of twos here's a four um and then the bottom parts are for the odd parts those are for the threes and the fives um and there are actually no sevens that i have on the bottoms but there are sevens that like like right at the beginning here these are sevens and like over here there's some sevens and over here there's some sevens there's sevens um throughout this and you know i said like but time signatures don't apply in the title or whatever um time signatures can apply as i said in the description uh, they definitely can apply uh, but i don't know if they're necessarily the best way of representing this you definitely can represent this with time signatures definitely but I don't know if they're the best way to do it, and it's not how I did it, and I successfully performed it, and I didn't use time signatures to, to notate it, I didn't think about this in terms of time signatures, and it's just so, there's, you know, if you wanted to notate this in time signatures, you just have to change time signatures pretty much constantly. Like, you might get two measures in a row of the time, same time signature, the tame sign signature. Anyway, um, like, at the very beginning, you do have pro arguably two measures of seven, yeah, uh, and then you know a few measures of five eight right here, you know. But but honestly, the most the most that you're gonna get throughout this whole thing is like three measures in a row that are the same time signature. And at that point, it's you know that it's not very signature of the piece, is it? Okay, that was bad. But um, the point is that this kind of way of representing it, this is ad hoc. Don't get me wrong, this is ad hoc, and I wouldn't like make this a new standard of of um of notation but uh, what i will say is that you know somebody in um in the live stream that i did where i was breaking this down but i i'm not using the live stream to actually upload because of all the technical difficulties somebody in the live stream you know they asked like have you ever th thought about making a notation software that like was more like this as opposed to western classical notation um and i hadn't thought about doing that but now i'm thinking about doing that um that doesn't mean it's going to happen okay don't get your hopes up but um I also am thinking about like how useful would that really be? Uh, one of the cool things about this kind of notation, this is obviously just a screenshot of FL Studio. Like I, I just, um, oops, hang on. Uh, is it still over here? Yeah. So this is just, um, I, this is from my demonstrating this in, in the live stream. But basically I just took this whole thing, right, of the, the metronome that I created. And then I basically just kind of split it into quarters and then did this. That's, that's pretty much all I did. Okay, these are like really, really rough. Um, but that's pretty much all I did. And then I just, um, you know, did this. And um, maybe did this as well. Woo. Oh, okay. Almost all of them. Hang on. Okay, there we go. <laughs> and then uh, I put some like blue patterns uh, what, pattern one or something? No. Pattern, oh, it's, it's labeled pattern one here. Well, whatever. Um, oh, it is pattern one, but just like this. Okay, I see. And I just put blue. <laughs> like that. There you go. I've recreated it. And then, um, obviously I like photoshopped these, um, chord symbols on. But, um, now that now you get to see the beautiful FL Studio delete animations. Ugh. Ugh. So nice. Like boom, boom. And I can delete delete it all at once. Ugh. So nice. Alright. So that's what this is. And yeah, 
uh, one of the cool things about this, this is what I was going to say, because this is based on this like constant 16th note grid, right? And so this, this song, it's not free time because like there is a constant pulse, but the pulse that's constant isn't the beat. It's like, okay, that's a bad way of putting it because pulse normally refers to a, a large, like the larger beat. Um, there is not a constant beat. There's not a constant BPM. But there is a constant like 16th note length. Like the 16th notes are all the same and they're based on 100 BPM, right? 100 quarter notes per minute. Um, 100 short beats per minute, you could say, right? And uh, because of that, and because this is a screenshot from FL, um, the kind of horizontal space on this, on this image, or if you print it out on the page, on the sheet, the horizontal space is directly proportional uh, and perfectly proportional to the amount of time that there is between events and what that means is that the harmonic rhythm and the harmonic speed like how quickly you change chords um is represented perfectly visually so you can literally just see that the harmonic rhythm is way faster on this last line than the second to last line because the chord symbols are physically spread apart more with western classical notation that's not guaranteed at all like if you just have a bunch of 16th notes in one measure and just quarter notes in another then one of them is like three times as long on the page but it's the same length in time. In this case, you know that it's it's all completely perfectly proportional, which is kind of cool. Um, and if I did make this into you know some real kind of notation software, what you'd probably have is not something messy like this, but maybe um, maybe for notating rhythms, you might have like blocks that are maybe color coded or certainly labeled with like three and five and, and whatnot. Um, and who knows, it might actually be useful to have like the kind of like upper and lower part of each line like I have here. Um, I, I feel like that was useful to have that like really visceral spatial separation between the even parts and the odd parts uh, of the rhythm. So maybe I would incorporate that as well. I don't know. Um, uh, you know, who knows? I'll think about it. Probably won't make anything, but you know, don't get your hopes up, but who knows? So yeah, that's that. Instead of closing it, I'll just I'll tab back to FL Studio. Um, the vocals, did I already mention the vocals took the least amount of time? I think I did. Um, and then we have this like a uh, little choir vocal. One of the things is that um, <laughs> um, the choir vocals continuing would have actually been kind of nice. Not gonna lie. And also this is wrong. They're more like down here in the original. Uh, so the choir vocals sound nice. They come in on this on this kind of um, climax of the piece. And glorious more fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angels' voices. Oh, night. Now having them be louder and then continuing on, right? Like if I make them quite a bit louder, it kind of still sounds pretty nice. And glorious more fall. Oh, hear the angels' voices, oh, night divine. Oh. But then it's like, where do they go? You know, and then they drop out, and it feels, it feels like kind of like you get let down. Like, I thought, you know, the energy doesn't really go down in the rest of the instruments, but the choir drops out, and it's like, eh. And I didn't think it was basically worth the effort to go through, um, based on, you know, like my level of skill in doing this kind of thing, and how long I think it would take me based on that skill. Like, I just didn't think it was worth it to try and do choir for the rest of it. Because for this part, uh, the harmonic rhythm is pretty slow. But like I was showing you earlier, like that's this part of the of the arrangement right here. And what comes after it is this, where the harmonic rhythm really speeds up. And these couple of, mm, I was going to say a couple of measures, I guess. Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm slipping a bit. I'm speaking of it in terms of time signatures. But um, yeah, which you certainly can. Uh, but this bit down here was kind of the last thing that I had to solidify in each of the parts. Like that part was kind of hard. It's this like 11 and then it's a, or sorry, it's a 12 and then an 11. Uh, it's a 12 in the form of a five and a seven, and then a, uh, an 11 in, for, in the form of a five and then arguably a six. Uh, but I mean, really you just need to look at like, it's three plus it's like three, two, 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 three, three, two, 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 right? Three, two, 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 three, three, two, 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 right? You have a 12 and then 11. Um, and that part tripped me up a lot. I mean, that, that part's pretty hard to do. Uh, the harmonic rhythm is changing really fast and the rhythm is also complicated, of course. And 
to actually record the choir vocals for that would have been a lot of effort so i didn't go to that effort and instead i just made the choir i just made the choir quieter and it kind of emphasizes the impact of of the fall which is just like you know this big moment in the piece but it didn't continue now one thing i wanted to note about this this section down here specifically is that what we've got is essentially um like i said a 12 and an 11 but the 12 kind of feels more odd than the 11 which is kind of weird like you would expect the 11 to feel more odd but to me at least maybe this is different for you but to me at least it feels more odd with the 12 the 5 plus 7 feels more odd and i think maybe it's just because i'm feeling it in that in in terms of the 5 and then the 7 which of course is two odd things which is going to add up to you know if i'm feeling like it's odd during the 5 and then i feel like it's odd during the 7 and i don't really like consciously and i don't mm, connect them in my perception too much then it's going to feel like there was an odd thing and then there was another odd thing adding up to a lot of odd things which feels odd but then the other one is like a five and then a six and a six obviously isn't odd so we don't have as much odd stuff so it d doesn't feel as odd even though the actual number of, of total you know subdivisions that it adds up to is odd in that case right so um this kind of like uh let's see if i can play it right now i need to get the mic stand out of the way so i can actually play the low notes um so let's see let's see if i can do this no 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 uh. Right, that's that's what's going on. So we have the that's the twelve, the five plus seven, and then you have the um, the eleven, which is like, and then that is the one in the next measure, I guess. Um, so if you, if you think of these as twelves and elevens, the twelve kind of feels more odd, which is interesting. Uh, but. I think that's about it. Um, let's see. Oh, no, that's not it. This. What is this? Okay. So maybe you already figured this out. But this is based on, or it's made of, the original kind of improv clapping and singing that I did at the beginning. But it's got this kind of weird alien sound to it. Um, and basically, I'll show you what's going on there. So if I enable MIDI. So check this out. If you have a uh, stretch mode on a audio clip in FL Studio, right? Like uh, it'll be defaultly on resample, but if you change it to stretch and you play with a, a MIDI note, I have like a MIDI MIDI controller here. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly It'll maintain the timing, but uh, yeah, it'll maintain the timing, but it'll change the pitch. Kind of cool. So if you play two notes together at once, Stars are Interesting, right? So, what I did to make that beginning is I just pressed um, a bunch of C's and then a G and a D to make a stack of fifths at the top. And then I recorded all of that. I recorded that playing through and then picked out a part that I really liked uh, and then did a couple of little micro edits to it like this. That's where the glitch happens in the video, which was kind of fun to make as I use DaVinci Resolve now because I'm on a, I have a new PC and I can handle DaVinci Resolve now. So I uh, wouldn't, have, wouldn't have done that in Lightworks, the old video editor that I used before. Um, but that was kind of fun. Anyway, uh, but did some micro edits, as you can see, and then uh, there's some panning that goes on here. Like, obviously, those are panned. They're not like hard panned, but yeah, they're panned like this. Uh, what's the next one? Yeah, I don't know. What is that? 32%. Okay, like 30% panned back and forth a little bit there. Uh, and then that was that. So uh, you actually do hear that that like first like improv thing um, you do hear some of that in this at the beginning, just right there. So that is about it, I think. So I'm just going to play through this and then this video will be over. So, uh, hopefully this was somewhat interesting. If you were wondering anything about how this got made. Cool. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.
Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Thank you for watching. I think my camera has migrated once again. But anyway, thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoy this. Link in the description to this track, uh, both the video and Bandcamp if you want to listen to it in higher quality. Very cool. All right. See you next time.